Hello, hello. Thank you so much for offering to sit through a lawyer, a federal lawyer, talk to you for about 10 minutes. I didn't think anyone had mentioned yet, but I did confirm with the, um, the managers here at the hotel, this is the very room where they do the Scripps National Spelling Bee. And so since I'm going to be discussing appropriations law with you, I thought maybe I should stand here and go, appropriations, A, P, P, R, O, P. Um, and I do have to give the general disclaimer that I am speaking on my own behalf. The opinions are my own, and they are not necessarily those that have been adopted by my agency or my bosses. Why should you listen to me? I'm their lawyer. <laughs> And I know almost all of you recognize Casey, Bev, and Martha as being major, major players in IT and in Gov2O. So of course, I'm not their only one. I work with a very talented team of colleagues, but I am one of the ones who handles most of the issues when they do come in. So a, a lot of you may wonder, what is GSA? Why is GSA all so heavily involved? And I didn't know if anyone had ever really told all of you. So really quickly, I thought that I would. We own and operate 8,500 buildings of the, in the federal government and all 300,000 plus vehicles of the federal fleet. We run all of the .govs and actually we are the ones in charge of handing out the .gov domain names, um, as well as we facilitate about $60 billion a year in annual spending, as well as $30 billion in the smart card program. So we spend a lot of money. I made this look intentionally bad. <laughs> I wanted you all to have an understanding of what we at federal agencies have to deal with every day trying to adopt Gov2O. This is, these are just the top 15. <laughs> there are a lot more, but I wanted to point out in particular federal appropriations laws, the Anti-Deficiency Act, the FAR, the Procurement Integrity Act, and the U.S. Rehabilitation Act, Section 508. When it comes to the Anti-Deficiency Act, this act is from the 1840s. Last night I was out running to burn off some steam after sitting here all day, and I was running around the mall and I was at the Lincoln Memorial, and it dawned on me in 2010 on bleeding edge technology like Gov2O, for me to get it to work for the federal government, I am bound by a law from 1840 that existed when President Lincoln was around. I have to somehow make it work. We do, like I said, I have a lot of talented colleagues but it takes a little bit of doing. The Procurement Integrity Act scares me to death. I will tell you why. Um, as an example, we have over 1,500 GSA employees on Yammer. Yammer is a wonderful tool, but it's not FISMA certified. And of these 1,500 employees, many are from the Federal Acquisition Service. And so they are collaborating, and they're doing a lot of talking, and I have tried to educate them as best I can, but I have a fear, because you know we are fatalists as lawyers, and it's our duty to protect our, our clients and our coworkers, I have this fear that they might accidentally let something slip about a source selection or some proprietary business data. Well, then by using Yammer, they have now violated the Procurement Integrity Act. And they could have all kinds of, of ramifications. Also, with Section 508 of the U.S. Rehabilitation Act, we have to have all of our websites be Section 508 compliant. And I know that a number of developers just go, it's not going to look as good when I have to do things to make them look compliant. I want to use this flashy, brand new technology. I don't want to have to make it accessible. Well, my challenge to you is you're all very smart people. Get your technologies and, like Tim Gunn says, make it work. There are a number of lethal terms of service provisions. Now, the, the, what I just showed you on the previous slide, those are barriers. For the most part, I can get through them and I can, I can help my clients like Bev and Casey use technologies, but there are some that are lethal. Number one is indemnification and attorney's fees. We as federal agencies can never indemnify a client, like in a indemnify um, a company in a terms of service provision. We also can never offer to pay attorney's fees. This is because of the appropriations laws. We can only spend the money that Congress gives us, and usually we can only spend it in one year. So in a terms of service agreement, which are very standard, I cannot promise to pay attorney's fees in year three, because I don't have that money from Congress yet. So that means I violated the Anti-Deficiency Act today by clicking the I accept provision on a terms of service, saying that I agreed to pay your attorney's fees. Um, also, under the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution, we can never be brought into state or local court. How many of you live in Santa Clara County? 
I see almost every terms of the service agreement that comes in for Gov 2.0. It's someone in Santa Clara County, and they want the government to agree to be drug into court into Santa Clara County. Not going to happen due to the supremacy clause of the Constitution. So one of the things I wanted to just share with you is I understand many of you have your policies. And oh, we don't want to change our terms of service agreement. But I have my laws, and I cannot negotiate around my laws. So if you want to play with GSA, if you want to play with the government, you're going to need to, to bend some of your policies sometimes. And I want to say, yes, the FAR does apply, even to that little widget that you're giving to the US government. Um, giving a widget to the government or some kind of apps for apps.gov means you are now a government contractor, no different than someone over in Iraq giving a tank. Now, government agencies, um, it varies from agen agency to agency as to whether or not we can accept your widget as a gift. Some agencies have gift acceptance authority. Some agencies do not. The agency has limited gift acceptance authority. But there is some exciting legislation. Well, I think it's exciting from a legal perspective. Senate Bill 3530 is now sitting with the Senate Commerce and Technology Committee. And what it will do is give broad gift, prize, and challenge authority to all executive branch agencies. So I'm, I'm following this bill. I hope it goes through because it will make federal lawyers' jobs a lot easier. I have had people say to me, oh, we're just going to go ahead and use it. We're just not going to worry about the lawyers. They just make everything go too slow, and we'll just ask for forgiveness afterwards. Isn't it better to ask for forgiveness? No. <laughs> no, it is not. Please don't do that, because your name could, as a federal employee, could end up on a letter like this one. Appropriations law violations and Anti-Deficiency Act violations go to the White House. I don't want my name on one of these letters to, to President Obama, and I don't want any of my colleagues to have their name on like this to a letter to President Obama. And uh, this was only for a $43,000 violation. So again, we can't just click through, and I tell all my colleagues this, we can't just click through terms of service agreements um, without negotiating out some of those lethal provisions or we could have a letter like this going to the White House. So apps.gov is here. I have a wonderful colleague named Mike Etner, and Mike Etner has negotiated well over 30 terms of service agreements, probably with some of you sitting in, in this room. So if federal employees and agencies go to apps.gov, they can find a federal-friendly terms of service where by clicking and by using it by their agency, they're not going to violate any of those lethal provisions I just discussed. Oh, and Twitter, by the way, was great. Twitter did not require us to negotiate a separate license with them. They just changed their base agreement and said, oh, if you're a federal agency, the following or the above didn't apply to you. I wish everyone would do that, because then we didn't have to sign a separate agreement. And I just wanted to show you um, NASA's YouTube channel. One of the things that we negotiate out are ads. So whenever you're at an official government channel, uh, or if you're on a Facebook page or on YouTube, you'll notice that there are no ads. Uh, one small thing I wanted to mention is that there's a, going to be a, a brand new world of federal apps for mobile devices. So far, GSA's first device's first app is up, and it is for the product recall. So you can type in uh, if you have Tylenol or if you have some beef and you need to find out, has this particular one been recalled, you'll know. I also wanted to get into federal IP protection very quickly. I know that when I talk about federal IP protection, Carl Malamud's dying a little bit inside. I don't know if he's in here. But you may not know that NIH brings in $100 million licensing its patents. And energy, I believe, is also up there. So I'm a patent attorney by trade, but I also do trademark law. So I thought to myself, OK, in this world of Gov 2.0, where everything is open source, I mean, my, my inclination is protect. But in the world of, of Gov 2.0 and open source, it's how do we make this available to the citizens? How do we get everything out there? Well, I think we still have a duty to protect the trademark and the brand. So we may not be offering patent protection, but we're offering branding protection. And I think it's a discussion that, should be, that needs to happen. So yes, in Gov 2.0, is brand protection more important than patent protection? My answer would be yes. And here's a quick example. Here is a teardown of an early generation iPod. You'll notice that almost nothing on here says Apple. It's all licensed technologies. And here's an Apple, uh, an iPhone 3G teardown. Again, there's like 20 different licensed technologies on there. What is important to Apple is the brand. And you can see three of their major trademarks down here, the whole evolution of the iPod. Well, in federal agencies, when people create uh, an, a new app for us, or we put, we've taken something open source from out on the street, 
Well, we don't own all of that underlying technology, but don't we have a duty to the citizens to have a total brand and branding protection so that when the citizens download something, just like when an Apple user goes to an Apple store, they know they're going to get systems integration and they know that they're, they're going to get some kind of holistic experience. Well, when citizens go to apps.gov or go to the iTunes store and download a federally uploaded and federally created app, don't we also have a duty to have an entire citizen experience and to protect that experience? My answer again would be yes. Federal agencies are very good at protecting their patents, but federal agencies, well, aside from the Marines and the Army, those are some pretty strong brands and their trademark attorneys are really on top of things. But in our executive agencies, we're not really doing a whole lot with thinking about how do we protect the citizen engagement and the citizen user experience with a federal app. I mean, I've heard about over 200 different apps in, this, in the kicker right now. And if somebody goes to iTunes and they download a Where's My Water application that they could use in a disaster, what if there are two other Where's My Water applications also on iTunes? And what if someone was misappropriating one of the federal trademarks or federal seals and then they download that app instead and they don't realize that they're getting the wrong app and maybe that app's not correct? Well, one of the things I do at GSA is I monitor how, our, how we're used, how we're seen um, online. I take down infringers, and I would just urge everyone that in this world of Gov2.0 that I shouldn't be the only one. So I made this, um, this slide myself. I'm not a PowerPoint guru, but I really do believe that there's a new legal su supercell going on. You can no longer just discuss cyber law strategic branding, citizen engagement, or trademarks without discussing all of them concurrently. And for far too long, the federal, agency, the federal agencies only just said, oh, social media, gov oh, privacy federal records. Privacy federal records. That's all they were worried about for years and years. And now, finally, there's starting to be more discussion of trademarks, but not the whole world of branding. So again, I was just going to say, I do routinely send out cease and desist letters. Um, Facebook is great about taking down infringing uses. So is Twitter when I see someone using our trademark when they're not supposed to. How many of you know that federal seals, the usage of federal seals is protected by a Title 18 criminal statute? So that's always fun to go after infringers in that way. I'm not just saying you're violating my federal trademark, but you could go to jail or face criminal penalties. So don't use federal seals. And sometimes there can even be new problems. You, I, I continuously have to monitor, like I said on Facebook, here's a Library of Congress community page and a Library of Congress official page. Can you tell the difference? The only, one, the only way I can really tell is that one doesn't have ads on the side. And the one that doesn't have ads on the side was one that was created through apps.gov because we negotiated out any endorsement issues from ads. So I know I'm over my time. I just wanted to say, please talk to your lawyers early on. Please know that there are tech-savvy lawyers. I'm just one of, of many. I have very talented colleagues all throughout the federal agencies. But GSA being a solutions provider, we just happen to see a lot of this first. So please talk to your lawyers at your own agencies. Or if they need to come to us, we're happy to help. There are a myriad of, of things, that, uh, all those laws but they are surmountable. They're just barriers. They are surmountable, except for the few lethal provisions. And I would really encourage everyone to consider strong brand protection. Thank you.